Sarah Tully on stage. Uh, yeah, hello, Sarah. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well, doing really well. I'm really glad to have you there. And Sarah, you will tell us about using APIs to transform the way CMS shares medical claims data. Mm -hmm. Are you on the screen? Yep. Tom, can you go full screen? Uh, am I not already? We see a little bit of the bar, you know. Uh, oh, I see, I see. Um, if it's possible at some point. Let's see. That's better, I think. I think but it might go away when I start. Yeah, let's, let, let's okay. try then. Let's try then. Thank you. Okay, cool. Well, good morning. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, my name is Sarah Tully, and I am an API product manager at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today and to share with you all my experience of how we at CMS are using APIs to transform how Medicare claims data is shared externally, how we are doing our uh, doing our part to build a greater interoperable ecosystem of APIs, as Shelby was talking about earlier, uh, and also something that Nick and Shelby both talked about. Um, I think we're doing a pretty good job treating our APIs as products, and that is part of the way in which we've been successful. So thanks so much to Shelby and Nick, who really set the scene for me in this presentation right now. Um, let's see. Uh-oh. How? Oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I'd like to focus uh, most of my time here on how CMS is using APIs for transformation. But before we get too deep into that, I want to level set on two terms, one being Medicare and one being claims data. So stepping back a bit, if you're not familiar with CMS, uh, President Lyndon Johnson signed into law the Medicare and Medicaid programs in 1965. Uh, CMS as an agency has taken several forms over the years, but today it is an agency within the US Department of Health and Human Services. So CMS has many functions, including Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, and the health insurance marketplace. Um, Medicare, which is the part of CMS that I work on, is a national health insurance program that primarily provides health care to Americans aged 65 and older, younger people with disabilities, as well as uh, people with end-stage renal disease, which is a type of permanent kidney failure. And sorry, my keyboard is not super keeping up with me here. All right, uh, so Medicare is a health insurance plan that is comprised of four parts. Medicare Part A, which covers inpatient hospital stay, care in skilled nursing facilities, hospice care, and some home health care. Uh, Medicare Part B, which covers certain doctor services, outpatient care, medical supplies, preventative services. Then there's Part C, which is a different type of Medicare health plan. Uh, it's offered by private companies and appro approved by Medicare. And then there's Part D, which helps cover the cost of prescription drugs. So now that we've reviewed uh, this concept of Medicare, I wanna talk quickly about claims data. So let's say you just visited your doctor. Um, after your appointment, the doctor sends a bill to your insurance company for any charges you didn't pay during your visit. The claim is then processed. So as an example, if you got an x-ray and your insurance only covers a portion of that service, you'll then get a bill for the remainder of the cost of the x-ray. Once the claim is processed and separate from the bill, you will receive what's called an explanation of benefit, which provides details on the payment for the services you received, including any medications or durable medical equipment, uh, any diagnoses and any procedures rendered. Uh, so while at its core, this explanation of benefit document is financial information, you can really glean a lot about a health encounter from this EOB. So I want you to think about the last time you got a pap smear or had a flu shot or had some sort of recurring procedure. Um, can you remember the specific date or maybe the year it happened? I know for me, I sometimes even struggle with the year. Um, so that's an example of the critical health data that is present in this medical claims data. And that's the meat of the data that we're talking about when I'm talking about claims data and how CMS is using uh, APIs to transmit claims data externally. So now that we're clear on Medicare and this idea of claims data, I want to tell you a story and I want to talk to you about my corner of CMS and how we went from a picture that looks like this in 2018 
to a robust ecosystem of fire compliant APIs that ultimately deliver value to Medicare beneficiaries in just a few years. I wanna to describe to you what specifically we've done to be successful, but I think we need to set the stage a little bit more before we do that. So in 2018, the My Health eData initiative was announced as a CMS strategic initiative to reduce costs while improving quality of care. Uh, the way in which we're hoping to do this is to build digital services to enable patients to make decisions, to empower providers to use electronic health information to improve care, and to use data to promote research and innovation to support advancements in healthcare. So one of the first initiatives of the My Healthy Data Initiative was this Blue Button 2.0 API. And it's uh, actually the program that Nick just gave a hat tip to in his, um, his program as having good developer docs. So I'm appreciative for that call out. Um, so several years ago, CMS had a project called Blue Button that enabled beneficiaries to download their claims data as a flat file. Um, in 2018, as part of this My Healthy Data Initiative though, uh, CMS thought, what if we took this claims data and made it available in a more dynamic format. Um, how can we inspire innovation and put data back in the hands of the patients? And so the Blue Button 2.0 API was born. Uh, for those of you not familiar with BB 2.0, as we call it, um, it's an OAuth and pass-through API that enables third-party developers to build applications that enable Medicare beneficiaries to connect their claims data to applications, services, and research programs they trust. Um, our, we're still working on making the elevator pitch a little smaller, but um, uh, so at the time of its conception, um, and for the purpose of this talk, how I'm, what I'm gonna be talking about, I want you to remember that there was a Blue Button 2.0 front end team, and then there was also a back end team. So the front end team was an OAuth and pass through API, and this back end team was the team responsible for ETLing the data from its upstream data source, formatting it into Fire, and passing it through to consumers through this BB 2.0 API. So a little more on Blue Button because I think it's a really interesting example of how we are supporting and being an industry leader in interoperability here at CMS. Um, Blue Button's primary customer is third-party application developers who are looking to build apps that directly serve beneficiary populations. So for instance, you might have a health plan that leverages BB2.0 to help beneficiaries select the best Medicare prescription drug plan. Uh, the application might integrate with BB2.0 as part of its user flow to enable beneficiaries to share their list of prescriptions through our API, rather than having to enter those manually, which of course would result in hopefully more accurate uh, documentation of your prescriptions and the dosages. So you might make a better decision about what health plan you're gonna choose. Uh, you also might have an app that enables you to simply download your claims data in a more usable interface so that you can carry it in your pocket. Let's say you show up because you're in an emergency situation and you don't remember the answer to one of the questions they're asking, you have Blue Button or an application using Blue Button in your pocket to say, oh yeah, the last time I had that was this date. Um, or uh, the last use case is for research applications, such as um, we've got a research uh, partner right now, Heartline, which is a new study. Uh, it's a collaboration between Johnson & Johnson and Apple Health, and they're using Blue Button 2.0 in a study to see whether the Apple Watch can detect atrial fibrillation among seniors, which is pretty cool. Um, so again, structurally, in the beginning, we had a Blue Button backend that in tandem with this front end OAuth and pass through API enabled third party application developers to put claims data in the hands of beneficiaries. So as I've described it, Blue Button is pretty cool, but um, considering that picture I showed you at the beginning, Blue Button is just a sliver of the ecosystem that we have today. Uh, the next sliver uh, or the next use case, use case for sharing claims data externally entered the scene in 2019 with an initiative that enables accountable care organizations to retrieve Medicare parts A, B, and D claims data for their patients via an API. Uh, so for those of you who are unfamiliar, an accountable care organization is a group of healthcare providers aimed at providing care coordination and chronic disease management to ultimately improve the quality of care that patients get. It's something that came out of the ACA. Um, 
So this new product known as the Beneficiary Claims Data API or BCDA was seeking to share claims data to groups of healthcare providers to give them a more complete picture of overall patient care and ultimately improve patient outcomes while hopefully reducing the cost of care. Now, there are certainly differences between commercial products and government products, uh, but one of the biggest differences, uh, if I were to guess, is that we're building our products with taxpayer dollars. And in an effort to be good stewards of taxpayer money, uh, my team is particularly cautious to not reinvent the wheel. And that's why APRs are so great. Um, when this new use case came up, we, um, which is a use case to send the same Medicare claims data that we were sending with Blue Button, but just to a new customer. Uh, we decided to plug in this new service to the existing Blue Button backend. So you can see in this diagram here, we have two different products all talking to the same backend service. Uh, technically, this was a great solution. Um, we were not reinventing the wheel. Um, it worked swimmingly uh, in terms of how our APIs are talking to each other. Um, they are consuming the same data, but just for different use cases. Blue button is individual patients authorizing access one at a time, whereas this BCDA API was bulk access to data for uh, patient populations. Um, but operationally, we had created a bit of a problem. Uh, we had multiple services plugging into this so-called blue button backend. Uh, but now this backend service was no more related to this blue button front end service. Um, as it was to this new BCDA product. So, but we still at the time were referring to this backend service as Blue Button. And more importantly, we were not set up to prioritize the needs of any customer other than Blue Button, even though we were now the backend service for two different products. So it was around this time that we realized that Blue Button had a semantics problem, that it was experiencing an identity crisis of sorts. And what we found was that we were complete conflating the BB 2.0 product and the backend service that actually handles the claims data. What we had on our hands though, or what we decided to see was an opportunity. Uh, we thought, what if we leveraged the service originally intended to be the backend of a single product to transform how CMS shares Medicare claims data more generally? So, Earlier this year, uh, the team rebranded away from the BB 2.0 backend to a new service called the Beneficiary Fire Data Server with a mission to enable the CMS enterprise to drive innovation in data sharing. So by dropping Blue Button from our name and expanding our mission and vision to include supporting all products or potential use cases, we enabled an operational shift towards an ecosystem of APIs that work together to support a greater purpose rather than several siloed products. So just to talk a bit more about this BFD service, and yes, we are aware of the pun and we're aware of it when we named it, we think it's a, a pretty big deal. Um, even since 2019, when we onboarded the second product, uh, this BCDA product that I discussed, we've since then even had several new customers, as you can see in this diagram here. Uh, so just to go into a few details about the BFD as a service, it is a standards-based fire API populated with claims data from an upstream data warehouse. Um, and it itself sits at the center of this ecosystem of special API, specialized APIs that make data available to different uh, use cases or different customers, such as providers uh, directly to beneficiaries, to accountable care organizations, prescription drug plan sponsors, uh, and more. So the BFD is a backend API effectively, and its peering partners are all front end APIs that for the most part deal with the authorization and authentication. So again, these three main components of the BFD are the ETL process, the database, and then the Fire API itself. Oh no, what did I do? Sorry, give me a second. Wrong button. Sorry. Okay. Um, and I lost my speaker notes. Okay. 
I think you guys can see my notes. So anyways, uh, the BFD is an API that is consumed by our downstream peering partners. Um, it has six years worth of data for 61 million Medicare beneficiaries. Um, it has three endpoints, a patient endpoint that has patient demographic information, a coverage endpoint that has the details of the patient's Medicare plan type or types, and then an EOB endpoint that has the meat of that encounter data we talked about earlier in this presentation. And my slides aren't switching now. Sorry about these technical difficulties here. Let's see, what can you see? Okay, I think that's switched in. All right, so leveraging the BFD, my team has built this robust ecosystem of API products that all um, transmit Medicare claims data to external services to deliver value to Medicare beneficiaries. So we talked about Blue Button already. We talked about this BCDA product already. I just wanted to mention a few of the others. We have an upcoming service called A and B to D that will use claims data to optimize therapeutic outcomes for beneficiaries and improve coordination of care. We also have the data at the point of care pilot that shall be mentioned, which is a program to share claims data directly with providers during an episode of care. And I wanna mention also that each of these service layers are also connected through FHIR. So up until this point, I've described Medicare claims data and the ecosystem of APIs that we've created related to sharing this data externally. But what I really wanna focus on today is the how. Um, to be clear, we are definitely a work in progress. I do not mean to stand up here and say we have everything figured out. Uh, after all, we've only been operating as an ecosystem like this for less than a year. But my hope is that in sharing some of the lessons we've learned along the way, uh, we might inspire other groups to reflect on the work that they're doing. So the first step towards building this ecosystem was to reframe the Blue Button 2.0 backend as its own product, which we've already talked about. The next step here was to treat the BFD as its own product, that is treat it as an actual first class citizen product. Uh, so as I've described it, BFD is a back end product. Um, it has no interface. It actually isn't even responsible for any of the developer documentation that's handled by each external service or service that's talking to those external customers. Um, but regardless, we've really made an effort to operate the BFD team as a product team. We are highly focused on understanding our customers and uh, prioritizing work that suits their needs, work that they say that they need done by our product. Uh, we have a dedicated product manager, we have a user researcher, we have a robust development team, and we have a distinct product mission and vision. Uh, we also employ human-centered design methodologies to explore, ideate, and develop solutions to solve our users' problems. And an example of this is work that we're doing right now um, Nick mentioned Fire, there's a new release of Fire and it is going to cause a breaking change in our next version of our API. And we're trying to figure out how do we roll out uh, a new version of our API that will have a breaking change to our customers in a way that is as painless as possible. So the next uh, item is the need to plan together as an ecosystem. And something we noticed right off the bat when we started to plug other products into the BFD was that it's super easy to get into a state of backlog coupling, meaning a peering partner would be dependent on us to do a thing and we would end up locking that team from being able to succeed because we didn't have the capacity to do whatever that was. So uh, something we're trying out at least is um, to onboard developers to our platform to have them actually contribute to our code base. Another thing we have found is that planning together is really valuable and not just our quarterly planning. We have regular touch points throughout the quarter. We have our team demos that we do as an ecosystem. We have a scrum of scrums. We have a community of practice for engineering and for product and for HCD. Um, and we use these meetings as a touch point to ensure we're staying out of a state of backlog coupling with our downstream partners, because that's definitely a risk that we have seen. Uh, the last thing is to ensure that we build in capacity for the unknown. So having multiple services, depending on your product is wonderful. Um, it makes the ecosystem have reusable components. 
uh, and you're not duplicating effort, which is the intention, but it also means that your team are the main firefighters or question answerers or performance triagers if something goes wrong. So we actually did the math this last quarter and realized that 40% of the work we did last quarter uh, was not on the backlog when we started. So we put in capacity this quarter to not um, to, to block off time so that we can both leave room for any critical 40% of work that we don't know about that comes up, but also deliver on what we are telling our leadership will deliver on. So what's next? Where do we need to grow to continue to enable this transformation and how claims data is shared? So one uh, approach we're currently experimenting with, which I mentioned briefly, is this idea of treating the BFD as a platform. No matter how well coordinated our teams are, resources will always be zero sum. Um, and we're oftentimes putting our partners uh, productivity or ability to deliver at risk. So in an effort to comment this, we're experimenting with having developers from our customer teams, other CMS teams, on board to our platform and actually contribute to our code base for features they need on our platform. The complexity here is, of course, figuring out the policy, the logistics um, of how we can maintain a code base that we're not necessarily writing all of the code ourselves. Another area we're exploring is this need to grow the supporting infrastructure of our ecosystem. Um, invest in features that benefit multiple products. Um, we are realizing that this ecosystem is more than the sum of its five discrete product teams, and we have to intentionally carve out time to invest in operationally maturing the ecosystem. So uh, what's the TLDR and how can you learn from our success? Um, I suppose I would sum up uh, what we've learned and what you might be able to take away from this. Four different points. Number one is to build your ecosystem of APIs. You should embrace an API first approach so as not to reinvent the wheel. Uh, number two, you should manage your APIs like a traditional product. Uh, treat it as a first class citizen and prioritize your users needs. Number three, and this is especially if you run an ecosystem similar to ours with a backend that supports several front end APIs, you should support the symbiosis of the API ecosystem and plan together to deliver together. And finally, you should save capacity for the unknown. Um, by following these principles here at CMS, we are transforming how we share claims data and ultimately empowering patients with more comprehensive access to their healthcare data. If you'd like to know more about these APIs, I have these uh, the product names and their websites up here on this slide. You can also reach out to me afterwards to ask any follow-up questions about any of them. I will just mention that the Blue Button 2.0 API and the Beneficiary Claims Data API are both live in production and have been uh, for a while. The Data at the Point of Care and this AMB to D product are going to be uh, onboarding its first production customers later this year. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Two really quick questions. Uh, uh, one technical, uh, one less. Uh, so we have a question from Shilpa. Where does smart on fire fit into all of this? Where does smart on fire fit? Sorry. I uh, sorry. Um, uh, so all of our APIs are fire compliant. Um, uh, it's smart on fire. Um, and that is part of the ecosystem, the wider ecosystem that we're trying to work to support at CMS. Uh, I think we were talking, or I mentioned earlier that we're in the midst of working with the interoperability space and HL7 fire specifically to uh, inform what this next release of Fire is going to look like, and any documentation that's related to that. Yeah, thank you very much. Another uh, another question, more about the community and the experience. So the the blue button name and brand like has been spread has spread quite well. Uh, how is in your in your daily experience? How is the power of branding into making things more, uh, let's say, uh, usable and understandable by the whole community? Yeah, that's a good question and something I've done a lot of thinking about. Um, this was sort of like an insider presentation to show you all how internally we've had to be like, stop calling everything blue button. It's something that you see all over the industry. People are like, your man, I just saw a question earlier that was like the mandate of blue button. It's like, well, no, actually what we're mandating is 
auth individual patient authorized access APIs. And that's what Blue Button is. But I feel like it's really snowballed into this Blue Button means something that it doesn't particularly mean anymore. And internally, operationally, that was causing us a lot of, uh, I mean, the operational angst that I talked about, everyone, everything was blue button, but actually nothing is blue button because blue button is a button for a different product. Uh, so I think that this, there's definitely a lesson to be learned in the power of branding. I'm not sure if the branding of blue button we can call a success story, but at least it is a quippy title that now everyone knows what I mean when I say blue button. But, you know, operationally, we're trying to figure out how to undo that a little and talk about how generally at CMS we're contributing to the interoperability space beyond Blue Button because now we have lots of APIs that are doing really good work, not just Blue Button. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for this uh, uh, quite uh, true explanation about uh, what's be what's happening behind the scene. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, it was a great talk and really insightful. And and so actually, you finished uh, the the three talks we wanted to have on U.S. Uh, API healthcare system. And, and now we have Adrian Bue who will tell us about, yeah, what's happening in APAC in the healthcare API world. Thank you very much, Sarah. Have a good one.